All right, it looks like it is about two o'clock and people are still filtering in, but I wanna go ahead and get started. One, because I know that you all are fundraisers and I hear from you all consistently that right now is a wild time of year. Um, so I cannot wait for you to hear what Steven has to share. Steven is a total wizard when it comes to understanding how donors want to be communicated with and how nonprofits can speak to them in a way that inspires them to stay involved. So uh, I cannot wait for you to hear what he has to say today. In, uh, or at least before we get started, just a couple little things. Um, if you don't know me, my name is Abby um, and I work with QGive. I see a number of names on our list that I recognize. So if you are a QGive client and you have any questions about how anything Stephen talks about today can be applied to your, um, your QGive account, or if you have questions about your Bloomerang integration, let me know. I can get you in touch with the right people to get you some answers. And if you don't work with QGive, everything you're gonna learn today applies to you as well. This is not fundraising platform specific. Um, and if you do have any questions about QGIV, let me know. Otherwise, I'm super happy to see you here and I hope you love it as much as I think you're going to. Just a couple little housekeeping things. Um, I'm recording this webinar and I'm gonna send you a follow-up email tomorrow morning that will contain a link to the recording and a few other resources that I think you're gonna find handy when you're planning out your donor retention strategy, at least for the end of the year and then into next year. And then if you are a Twitter user, I included the QGive and Bloomerang tags here. Go ahead and follow us if you would like to. We share a ton of great links, a lot of different best practices that you can apply in your day-to-day -day life, and then uh, at least the occasional random GIF or GIF, depending on how you say it. That all being said, I'm gonna go ahead and turn things over to Steven. I have gotten a sneak peek at this presentation and I cannot wait for you guys to, to see what he has to say. Yeah, this is a good one. This will be fun. Let me see if I can get the sharing work in. Hopefully this works. And then let me go to present. This is always a fun transition. Yeah. Okay, I think it's working. Awesome. It is. Well, cool. <laughs> thanks, Abby. Thanks for having me. And um, thanks to all of you for hanging out for an hour or so today. I know you're super busy. You know, we're getting close to year end um wild times out there of course but we're gonna have some fun um this is a very practical presentation i don't have a lot of fluff or uh, platitudes for you got some data got some case studies some examples some new research we've done and um hopefully you'll come away with maybe a few ideas you can do to um really make those new donors those people who have given their first and only gift um feel special you know there's a couple of reasons why i love talking about this in october specifically especially October 2020, one of the reasons is if you've gotten a brand new donor, if you've gotten a first time gift since March, since COVID began, that's a really special gift. And I'm going to give you some ideas of maybe how you should approach those people. And then the second reason is we're getting close to year end. This is the time, at least when we see from our customers, that you get the bulk of your brand new donations, people giving for the first time. It makes sense. You're probably doing a lot of outreach right now. You've got Giving Tuesday. Maybe you're doing some peer-to-peer -peer campaigns. Um, so this is a really good time. I, I give this one you know, all, all throughout the year, but, but you listening in October, um, very timely for you. So <clears throat> before we get into it, just a little bit about me. Uh, like Abby said, I'm Steven. I'm over at Bloomerang. Uh, if you're interested in Bloomerang, you know, you can check us out offline. Um, not really going to talk too much about Bloomerang here. We're pretty easy to find. But um, my job for them is basically to do this kind of thing. I do a lot of webinars, do a lot of speaking, um, sharing the research, sharing the surveys and, and things that we have seen, uh, not just from our customers, but through some, some other research projects that I'm involved with um, outside of Bloomerang. So that's what I got for you today. Would love to connect with you afterwards. I'm pretty easy to find, you know, look me up on LinkedIn, Twitter, send me an email, I'll give you all that contact info, because I'd love to keep talking to you um, afterwards. It doesn't have to be a, a one-time thing. So let's set the table, you know, why, why first-time donors? Um, there are a lot of different kinds of donors that we could be talking about. This isn't meant to rank one donor over another kind. This isn't based on order of importance, but I do think it's, it is placed a little bit in order of 
urgency. I'm going to kind of make the case for why you should specifically have a plan for your first time donors. And again, that's not you know mutually exclusive to having a plan for your monthly donors, for your peer to peer donors, for your you know whatever other type of donor you want to focus on. It's good to have plans for all those individual people. But I only got an hour with you, but we're going to focus on first time donations specifically. I think it represents maybe one of the low hanging fruits in terms of opportunity, reasons for urgency, uh, and, and why you should care about them. So we'll get into those things. You know, I think the, the main point here is that any, any awesome gift outcome that you would want from a donor, you know, a major gift, uh, a planned gift, uh, someone contributing to your capital campaign, someone maybe becoming a board member or a volunteer, a monthly donor, that always has to start somewhere. Very, very rarely does someone start by doing one of those big things. Usually they start off with their first you know, modest gift, giving you 20 bucks or 50 bucks, and you start that relationship. All those relationships have to start somewhere, and they usually start with that first kind of smaller gift. And, you know, um, if you don't do very specific things, if you don't zero in on those people, it can be hard to get a second gift from those people, let alone get them to become a major donor or leave you a gift in their will or any of those awesome things. Now, it's not just my opinion on that. We have research on this. We have scientific data to show that it's hard to get brand new donors to give again for just the second time, let alone something really awesome. Um, I alluded to this before, but one of those external um, research projects that I'm involved with uh, on a volunteer basis, very, very minor volunteer role, nothing nothing big, enough that I get a sneak peek at the data they put out is, um, is through the Fundraising Effectiveness Project. And if you've attended webinars from me or Bloomerang webinars, you know, I always talk about this. So if, if this isn't new to you, um, that's okay. I got I got new data for you. I promise. If you if um, you know there's something new in this presentation for everybody, but for the majority of you listening, if you haven't heard of FEP, check them out. Go to their website. Bookmark their website. Lots of really cool free tools, free research on there that I think will help you. But their sort of crown jewel that they really focus on is their annual donor retention report. Now we're giving this in October. Um, we will have new data. We'll have the 2020 data in January. For now, the, the latest data we have is the 2019 calendar year. Since we're still in 2020, we don't have the full data yet. Um, but if you follow me, maybe you subscribe to my newsletter, you'll be able to do that later on. You'll get that new data when it comes out. But this is where we are currently at, at least looking at the 2019 calendar year. Uh, the average donor retention rate in the sector is just about 45%. And if you follow donor retention, you know that that number pretty much hasn't changed very much, right? That 40 to 45 percentile is, is where most donor retention rates are, depending on the year. Um, but one thing that the FEP project does is they zero down into first-time donor retention. Um, and the latest number we have there is that for new donors, they're only retained about 20% of the time. So 80 out of 100 first-time donors never give a second gift, right? So 8 out of 10, you lose. Um, they never give again. That's really why I put this presentation together, because every time this report comes out, I see that number. It's usually around 20%. It's just like, wow, this is a major problem, right? To lose 8 out of 10 of our first-time donors that is a significant, significant percent of those people. That is, that's more than a leaky bucket. I mean, that basically doesn't have a bottom to that bucket. But you can see that if you can get a second gift and if you can get a monthly contribution, those new donors, those, those retention rates really improve pretty quick. You know, they more than triple to 61%. And then monthly giving, that's really the secret to, to donor retention. You know, we can save some time there. If you care about donor retention, you should have a monthly giving program and really focus on that. Um, but the first job, like I said, is moving those first time donors into their second gift. And that second gift could be a monthly contribution. That is possible. Um, uh, but that's job number one, at least to me. Now, again, you want to have a plan for repeat donors. You want to have a plan for monthly donors, you know, all these other things, but you should also have a plan for brand new donors. This is something I don't see very often 
internally at nonprofits is that they have some sort of um, strategy, you know, plan for for getting that second gift. Having a second gift strategy um, can generate a lot, a lot of ROI for you. We'll get into those things. The other reason that this is, you know, why I put this presentation together is not only is that 20% rate really low, but it's also fallen um, over the last five years consistently, right? So it was around 25% back in 2015, but it's gotten worse every single year. For, so for whatever reason, it seems to be getting harder to retain these brand new donors. And, and there are a lot of theories on this. You know, I don't have a lot of concrete data on it. And I don't like to share, you know, much with, with folks without it being data backed. But my, my gut instinct is that it's kind of a good and bad thing happening, right? The, the uh, barrier to entry to becoming a donor has lowered, right? It's never been easier to donate, right? You can donate through your phone, through Facebook, through peer-to-peer -peer campaigns. That's great. The cost for acquisition is low in many cases. It's very democratized. That's all great. I think the flip side is, is that with all these new donors coming in and through and sometimes through very transactional means, it can be harder to retain those people. Um, so there's kind of a good and bad thing happening there, but it's definitely something you wanna watch out for. And it might be good if, if you um, can sort of calculate this for yourself and see where you are. It'd be interesting to hear from you backward uh, if, if you do that. Uh, to see where you stand if you're above 20 or below 20. And and I would suspect that when we get the 2020 numbers, I think we'll be in the teens just because that's the, how the trend has been going. So that's the opportunity, right? Um, a lot of nonprofits don't focus on the new donors. They get new donors, maybe they just go unnoticed or maybe nonprofits, I don't know, just kind of assume that they're gonna give again, but most of them don't unless you are proactive. And there are, um, there are a lot of kind of downstream effects to this, right? One thing is just ROI. I mentioned this before, but um, in many cases, unless you get that second gift, you've got negative ROI off that donation, which seems counterintuitive. You know, you got a donation that seems like that would be good, but if your cost to acquire that donor is higher than what they gave, you gotta have that second gift to get back out of the out of the red and into the black, right? Um, so that's a real tangible thing. You know, sometimes I tell this to board members and it really opens their eyes. And it's like, yeah, we, we need that second gift just to get back into, you know, positive territory. We actually ran the numbers on this because we're kind of geeks at Bloomerang. I know this is a super busy slide, but basically it's just comparing one organization to another. The top the top table is, is one pretend organization with a 20% new donor retention rate and the bottom table is another organization at a 30 percent new donor retention rate so just 10 percent higher than the national average doesn't seem like that significant of an increase but you can see that lower organization they're raising almost a quarter million dollars more from that retained group of of new donors at just that 10 percent increase um, so Increasing these rates can mean a lot, a lot of extra revenue for you, not to mention a higher possibility that they would do things like become a monthly donor, you know, become a major donor, a planned gift donor, all those good outcomes we talked about before. And if you're curious about what that could mean for your organization, visit the link later on when you get the slides. You can download the spreadsheet, you can plug in your numbers, your average gift size, your specific rates, you know, your uh, database size. And you can see, maybe you can show your boss or your board members, hey, this is how much more money we could get if we can increase these rates. You know, maybe we should focus on these things. And the same thing stands true for your overall retention rate. This is the exact same thing. It's comparing a 41% overall retention rate to a 51% overall retention rate. And you can see the organization with just a 10% higher rate you know, they're raising almost a half a million dollars more from those retained donors. But again, what these slides isn't showing might be more compelling. Higher chance that those people would do other things besides donate. Maybe they volunteer, maybe they do a peer-to-peer -peer campaign for you through QGive, maybe they go out on Facebook, raise money for you. Lots of awesome benefits besides just those extra dollars um, that people give you. But my main point in showing you these busy, busy math slides I apologize for that. You probably already eaten lunch and maybe feeling a little sleepy, but the main thing is a small change in these retention figures 
can really mean a world of difference. So, you know, when people ask me or customers ask us, hey, what retention rate should we shoot for? I say, you know, an improvement over what you already have. Are you at 41%? Great. Can you get to 45%? You know, are you at 20% first time? Can you get to 25%? That can really be transformational for, for organizations rather than, you know, pulling out an arbitrary number and maybe getting frustrated or disappointed when you don't hit those things. Another thing we're looking at at FEP is uh, the recapture rate. So this is the percentage of donors who have lapsed, but then come back and give again a year or two later after lapsing. And you can see this is a really low percent. This is less than 4% of those lapsed donors ever come back. And it's on a five-year decline. So I show this because if you lose a donor, especially a first-time donor, it's really, really tough to get them to come back and give again. So we're gonna talk about how to kind of capitalize on uh, the recency of the giving. There is kind of a honeymoon period when it comes to these donations, but we'll talk specifically about how to get those second gift from people. Um, there's some interesting research from the analytical ones that showed that if you do get a second gift, the faster you get that second gift after the first gift, the higher those donation amounts tend to be. So there is kind of a zero to three month, you know, 90 day honeymoon period where you get a new donation, you thank them, you do a lot of the things I'm going to recommend to you. And then it's okay to ask them very quickly. A lot of organizations think that, gee, we got to wait a year until we ask them, got to wait nine months until the next appeal goes out. It's okay to ask these people quickly, as long as you do some very specific things in between that ask and their first gift. And we're gonna talk about what those things should be. The other thing, if you just need more you know, ammo to, to kind of make your case here, it's harder to acquire a brand new donor than it is to retain a donor you already have. It costs more, it's harder, it's slower, the response rates are much higher on renewals. And that's why I tell people, you know, why not have a retention strategy? You should still have a, an acquisition strategy. You should not stop donor acquisition ever for any reason. You know, that's not the point of this, but you should also have a very robust retention strategy. You know, they can work together very well and that'll create a very well-rounded sort of revenue stream for you. And I alluded to this before, but those people that leave major gifts, plan gifts, bequests, those really great high high value outcomes that you know most of us strive for, <clears throat> those people of course start off in most cases as, as a, a one-time donor. But the people who are retained over a long period of time tend to be the best prospects versus someone who just happens to be wealthy or older, has a lot of capacity. Those things are important but they pale in comparison to longevity of giving. People have given to you for five or more years. Are they a monthly donor? Do they give multiple times a year? Those retained, you know, long-term loyal donors tend to be the best prospects versus, you know, rich strangers. You know, people will always ask us, you know, how do I find, how do I find the rich people in my bloomerang? And I kind of pump the brakes on that and say, well, that, that may be interesting to look at, but, you know, let's run a report of people that have been giving to you for five or 10 years. And then maybe let's do some wealth screening on those people and see what we can find there. That's usually a better way to start than just kind of going after the, you know, the Bill Gateses and the Oprah Winfrey's in your individual communities. So hopefully I've made the case for at least why you should care uh, about retention, especially new donor retention. I, I think the next logical step is, okay, how, how do we increase these rates? How do we keep people giving for years and years? There's a lot of research on this. There's research from um, Adrian Sargent, Penelope Burke. Um, you know, we've done little kind of ad hoc surveys here and there. There's a ton of donor loyalty research out there that all basically comes to similar conclusions, even though they look at different data sets. I, I want to show you one kind of cherry-picked research study. I like it because it lines up with most of the other research that I've seen out there that usually comes to about the same conclusions. Um, I also like it because it, it kind of it lays it out in a way that is very um, easily uh, converted into some tangible strategies and tactics that we can all do. And this study was done back in 2011 by uh, the Donor Voice. Check out thedonorvoice.com later on. 
uh, lots of other free research on there. They're a really cool resource. Um, they can they can help you with lots of other things besides retention. But they did this survey where they they reached out to um, a cohort of nonprofits, kind of looked at their databases, and they sort of isolated some real longtime loyal donors that had been giving to those nonprofits. And they surveyed those donors and basically asked them, hey, why do you keep giving to these organizations? Like, what are they doing well? Um, on, on purpose, uh, you know, besides themselves, you know, whatever it was they were doing, that's okay. But they were trying to figure out why do these keep, people keep giving? What are these nonprofits doing um, that keeps them in the fold? And the top seven reasons they got back from those loyal donors are pretty telling. This, this is um, a really good way to kind of think about retention, stewardship, your communication strategies. If you do these seven things, I feel very confident that your retention rates will improve. Um, now, these are not easy things to do. I think a lot of times these things require a little bit of a paradigm shift in, in how maybe our organizations think, but they are kind of simple concepts. This is This to me is kind of the North Star for donor retention. Now, I just want to roll through them really quickly, and then we're going to kind of reverse engineer all seven of them to first-time donors specifically. How can you make these things kind of come to life for your brand new donors? But as we go through them, think about other types of donors also, peer-to-peer -peer donors, monthly donors, your event donors, which are probably virtual event donors these days. You can kind of think up and come up with strategies for all those different types that are based on these seven concepts. And even though there's seven things here, you'll see they kind of start to repeat. There's really only maybe four or five here uh, tops. But let's go through them. So number one thing is that these uh, donors, they felt like the nonprofits they were giving to, you know, kind of did what they said they were going to do, right? And they were they were reporting back to the the donor that those things were happening. They were sharing success stories, case studies. Um, you know, the client stories that maybe we, we talk about at events or in videos or in the annual report, constantly reporting back to the donor what their gift was doing out in the community. And again, if you look at any other donor loyalty study, you'll see that that thing in the top three um, as or, or, you know, number one in a lot of cases. You cannot report on successes enough to donor or too much to donors. They love it. It gets them thinking about the tangible impact that their gift is doing out there, and it makes them feel like you know that giving is really making a difference. Q is a little uh, interesting compared to the rest of them. Donors don't like to be you know caught off guard by anything that you're sending to them. I think this one speaks you know directly to communication segmentation, right? You're you're talking to different donors differently, and in ways that kind of make sense for who they are. Right, you wouldn't ask a major donor to suddenly become a five dollar a month donor with you when they're giving, you know, five or six figures every year or to a campaign. And conversely, you wouldn't try to upgrade, you know, a five dollar a month donor to suddenly give you, you know, five thousand dollars a year to a capital campaign. Not only that, but you should tell the donors uh, as often as you can what they're going to be getting from you right so if you get a new donor for example you might want to say hey you know be on the lookout for our newsletter we got you subscribed to that you know we're having an event in a couple months look out for that invitation or generically saying hey you know we can't wait to tell you about all the great things your gift is going to do uh, over the coming weeks and months you know be on the lookout for those stories so giving the donor kind of an idea of what's going to come next is a good thing to do. And I'll kind of show you some examples of what that looks like here in a second. Three, kind of an obvious one. Donors like to be thanked. Obviously, thanking donors is good. We're going to talk about thank yous. But what's nuanced here is the speed of the thank you. They get a timely thank you. The faster you thank a donor, the better, especially brand new donors. We're going to talk about kind of what that sweet spot is for brand new donors. But thanking is good thinking quickly is even better. Four, are you surveying your donors? Are you asking them questions about not only why they give and kind of what makes them tick, but how they feel about your organization? You know, are we thanking you well enough? Are we telling you the right stories? You know, how are we doing communicating to you? Those things are good. And again, that benefits all donor types, not just brand new donors, but we're gonna zero in on how to do that with those newbies for sure. Um, five through seven, these concepts kind of start to repeat, right? They feel like they're part of an important cause. Well, if you've 
if you've explained to them that you are an important cause, if you're telling those stories, they're going to feel like that's there, especially if you do it in a donor centric way, right? I know it's kind of a buzzword. We see that a lot in webinars and blog posts and things, but five really comes down to donor centricity. Are you weaving them into the story? And you got to be careful. You can go overboard with this. I'm definitely sensitive to the dangers of, of being overly donor centric. But if you do nothing else other than saying, hey, Abby, I just want to tell you a story about, about what your gift made possible for us this month. Um, you know, Here's a quick story about maybe an animal who was rescued, a kid who went through our program, and it's all because of donors like you. That's, that, I think, is um, good donor centricity, not problematic. And, and won't get you into too much, you know, kind of donor worship trouble there. But five, donor centricity for sure. Six, are you thanking them? Do they feel appreciated? Well, if you are thanking them and thanking them quickly, they should also probably feel appreciated. So you can kind of cross that one off. And then seven, similar to number one, who's being helped? You know, what's the environment that you're cleaning up? What is the disease you're uh, battling against? Who are the kids that are going through your program? You know, who are the people that you're helping get jobs? Whatever those things are tell those stories right do them in a non-exploitative way of course um, but tell the stories donors love 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 to get those stories you don't just have to hide them in your annual report in your your yearly gala tell them all the time tell them in thank yous tell them in appeals tell them in stewardship pieces the, the newsletter for sure on your website you, you can't do enough there as long as you do it respectfully and, and not exploitatively so Really, what I have for you the rest of the the time is, again, how can we take these you know five or six concepts and sort of reverse engineer them for brand new donors? We want to make sure that brand new donors get thanked quickly. There is a window of opportunity uh, for that that has the highest impact. We'll talk about that. Can we tell donors stories? Now, you haven't spent their money yet, right? They just they've just given for the first time. How can we do that in a way that kind of previews what that impact is going to be? And how can we also set the stage for future communications, kind of give them a sense of what it is they're going to be getting from you? First time donors, I think, are often surprised and not prepared for the things that you're going to send them. And that is an important aspect. We're going to talk about that. Are we getting to know these people, right? They're virtually strangers to us. They're a brand new donor. We know a little bit about them, maybe. But we got to get to know these people. That's the best way to communicate to them going forward is if you have a basis for what it is that makes them tick. Why do they care about your cause? How did they give? How do they want to be communicated to? We want to ascertain that information. And of course, we want to ask them to give again somewhat quickly. We don't have to wait for their anniversary of giving. We don't have to wait a year. We don't have to wait till year end as long as we do those first things and really make them feel good and then kind of wrap that all in kind of a donor centric bow. So that's what we're going to do. I got some examples for you. Um, and you'll be able to kind of draw on these things for inspiration. I think the number one thing you should do, and this is my homework for you, is, is have a plan for new donors. Have a set of communications, um, different thank you letters, you know, different stewardship pieces, um, a cadence for communicating to them that is unique to brand new donors. I think new donors are a, a unique group for all the reasons we said before, the low retention rates, you don't know them very well, you wanna get the second gift. These new donors should get things from you that no other type of donor gets, right? Like a welcome kit. I think maybe some of you listening are probably already doing that. That's great, that's really all I'm talking about here. They get a welcome kit, an annual repeat donor isn't gonna get your welcome kit. They probably already have hopefully gotten it. Um, maybe what you say to monthly donors is unique to them. So, and again, you don't have to stop at just brand new donors. You can have unique plans for all these different types of donors, but know what they're gonna get, a brand new donor. Okay, are they gonna get a phone call? Are they gonna get a welcome kit? Are they gonna get a handwritten note? All three, do they get a tour invitation? It's probably done virtually these days but know what it is they're gonna get from you in those early days of, of that engagement. And all I'm really talking about here is, is segmentation. I know that's kind of a buzzword, you know, it's kind of a mouthful, but segmentation is an awesome, awesome strategy and you don't just have to stop 
at brand new donors. You should have specific communication segments for lots of different types of donors, not just the brand new ones. But if you haven't ever done this, I would start with brand new donors because it's, it's probably the easiest to create new communications for. Basically, you're welcoming them, you're trying to get to know them, you know, you're setting the stage, but you don't have to just stop there. You can do monthly donor segments, you can do, you know, loyal donors. This is an example if you want to, you know, kind of dip your toes in these waters. This is one of my favorite fundraisers. She's up in New York State. Uh, she's like the queen of segmentation, right? She's got all these segments. She communicates to all of these different types of donors differently because they all have very different motivations, different recencies and frequencies of giving, and she can communicate to them um, in a unique way compared to the other segments. So, so they're a school foundation. So they've got parents of, of kids in the district. They've got people who live in the district but don't have kids in the schools because they either don't have kids or they're too young or old or whatever. And then they've got um, the recency and frequency. They've never given, they've given once. That's what we're talking about, first time donors. Maybe they've given once before, but they've lapsed, or maybe they're they're giving all the time, you know, giving annually. So she communicates to these people differently. And it really pays dividends because they're able to speak to the direct motivations in some cases, or kind of remind them or thank them of for the previous giving. So this is kind of the extreme that I'm getting at here. This is a good end goal for you. This is probably not something you're gonna be able to put together by the end of the week, but start in the middle there with that given once you know segment. And if you want, you can layer in things like the gift amount. Do they give above average? Do they give below average? You might wanna do some different things for people who give above average versus the ones who give below, but I'll let you be the judge. This is, um, this is a template for you. Uh, this isn't meant to be you know, the final state for everybody, but I think this is a pretty good jumping off point if you wanna do what I'm recommending, which is to have a concrete, unique plan or cadence for brand new donors. And we put this plan together by looking at some of the data from our customers of kind of what they did um, for the organizations that seem to have high new donor retention rates. And we kind of amalgamated stuff and, and kind of combined things to make it sort of general for everybody. But this is, a, I think, a pretty good starting off point, right? You get a new donation. Hey, let's call that person within 48 hours. I'm going to show you the data to kind of back up why we think that. Now, this is if you get a phone number. If you don't get a phone number, I, I wouldn't recommend, you know, necessarily trying to find their phone number online or anything like that. If you get a phone number for a brand new donor, I would call that person quickly. Most of it's going to go to voicemail. That's okay. Voicemails are, are good too. It's kind of a digital, you know, handwritten note. But if they do pick up the phone, you know, you can say thank you. Maybe get to know them a little bit. I think you're going to have a little bit of small talk just inevitably. Hey, Abby, you know, thanks for your first gift. Just wanted to give you a point of contact at, at this organization. You know, we're so thankful for you. You know, by the way, what motivated you to give? You know, have you been touched by uh, our mission in your personal life? That information you, that you can get in that conversation can be so, so valuable in how you communicate going forward. If you don't get a phone number, um, hey, maybe a one-to-one -one email. You know, dear Abby, thanks so much for your donation. Again, saw it was your first donation. Thank you so much. Can't wait to have you as part of the family. You know, if you ever want to ask me questions, here's my contact info. So that can be just as good if you don't get the phone number. Then maybe you're sending them a welcome kit in the mail, right? Maybe a handwritten note, maybe a nice welcome kit, your letter, you know, something in the mail um, to supplement maybe the phone call or the email receipt that they got if they gave online. Um, survey them early on, right? Send them a quick survey. Hey, we just want to get to know you more. You know, why did you give? What do you expect from us? You know, what would you like to hear from us? I got a lot of different sample questions you can ask there. And then they're probably going to get, you know, your, your email newsletter that you're sending out to everybody. Maybe after the first month, you weave in uh, a virtual tour invitation. You know, maybe all the brand new donors from that week or that month, maybe they get invited to, you know, an exclusive Facebook Live or a Zoom chat with your ED or a service recipient. Maybe you take them on a behind the scenes tour of your shelter or your school, your camp, you know, whatever you are, something interactive, something where they can kind of see your mission unfold. And then later on, maybe you're sending them some more mail 
uh, a stewardship piece. Maybe you send them a, a, a photograph of a service recipient. Just say, hey, Abby, you know, this is a, a thing that happened here at our place. It's all because of donors like you. Just wanted to say thanks again. And then if you've done some of these nice things, I think it's okay to go back and ask them again to give. And hopefully you've learned about them and maybe you can kind of contextualize that ask, right? If you learn something from them in the phone call or during the tour, or if you if you talk to them on Zoom or whatever, you know, maybe you can kind of weave in the things you've learned in that appeal. But again, do it contextually. If someone gave you $5 as their first gift, I wouldn't suddenly try to jump them up to $500 or $1,000 or a multi-year pledge or something like that. But maybe if they gave you $5, you could go back and say, hey, Abby, you know, you joined our family of donors a couple of months back. We're so appreciative. Wanted to let you know about our monthly giving program. It just so happens to start at $5 a month. You know, you could keep that donation going year round and make a really big impact. That could be a really interesting way to move these people into monthly donations. But let it let what you have learned and what you know about that donor kind of guide you rather than just kind of throwing them into this giant list that's going to get your generic, you know, year end appeal. That I think is what what really kills retention is when you throw everyone into one giant list and you send everyone that one generic appeal that isn't tied to their previous giving. It can't speak to everybody, right? Because if you're if you're talking to a thousand people who all have very different motivations, I think it can be hard to kind of zero in on what specifically motivates them. You know, maybe you have a year end appeal for people who have only given once, you have a year end appeal for people who give monthly and you want them to maybe give more or give extra. You have a year end appeal for people that give every single year like clockwork. That's what I'm really getting at here, right? But specifically have something for monthly donors. I think what so ha happens so often is you get a brand new donor, right? Today's October 6th, we're recording this on the 6th. You, you donate on the 6th and gee, that fall appeal is scheduled to go out on October 10th, they may get that appeal from you before they even get thanked for that original gift. And imagine, you know, it's kind of a slap in the face, right? They give, and the very first thing they get from you isn't a thank you, but another ask. That's why I recommend so highly that you put these people on kind of their own little private communications highway where they're only getting things that only first time donors are getting, you know, kind of leave everybody else out in, in a generic list if you want. But insulate these people, protect them, thank them, tell them some stories, get to know them, and then convert them. And I think you'll have a lot higher success rate uh, on those appeals if you do it that way. And some, the reason why we're so aggressive on the, on the speed of thanking these people is we have other research that shows that that's effective. McConkie Johnson, they found that if you call a brand new donor within 48 hours of their gift, um, a personal thank you, that can be a phone call, that could maybe be a personal email, um, you know, maybe even a video, depending on how you define personal, but I think phone call definitely fits the bill. Um, it quadruples retention. You go from 20 to 80% if you think quickly. And I don't, I, I can't remember really ever been being thanked that quickly. I think it will make a positive impression that, hey, you're paying attention, right? And you want to get to these people quickly. Um, Penelope Burke found that if a board member does that, not only can you assume the retention rates will increase, but it also increases their next gift size by almost 40%. So they give more. So there does seem to be kind of this 24 to 48 hour uh, window of opportunity. And we were curious about this. We, you know, we, we talk about this research and I share it and it's been floating around, you know, conferences and stuff. But at Bloomerang, we put it to the test in January. We looked at all of our customers um, who call brand new donors versus the ones who don't. Now, this is within 90 days. So this is definitely a, a slower threshold than 48 hours. Um, but we found that the organizations who do call brand new donors, they do have higher retention rates than the ones who don't, especially if they call multiple times within 90 days. Now, these are stewardship calls. So thanking calls, maybe, you know, survey calls, getting to know you calls, thanking calls for sure. Um, but it works, right? We, we, we have the data to prove it. You can look at the full research later on. This came out in January. We also found that you get that second gift faster 
if you do call, right, I showed you that research from analytical ones early on, this completely corroborates it, that the faster, if you want that second gift faster, it takes some stewardship and phone calls really work, you know, within 60 days, uh, in some cases, if they get the second gift or the second phone call. And then we also found that the gift size was higher uh, compared to other organizations who did get second gifts, but didn't do these stewardship calls. So the phone is great. I think the phone is kind of making a comeback in this COVID era. Now, if you're sitting there listening and saying, I don't like getting phone calls, so I'm not gonna call my donors, my, I'm gonna be a little tough and say, it doesn't matter how you feel about phone calls. Like this, we got the proof, like the proof is in the pudding. Now, not 100% of your donors are gonna respond this positively. That's okay, but don't worry about one person at the expense of you know 99 others that it could really help. Um, and again, if your board member says, I don't like calls, you know, we're not going to call, have them come talk to me. I'll talk to them. I'll, I'll convince them. I'll show this to them this data. I don't mind. Now, that's one of the reasons why we built out a tool in Bloomerang to facilitate this. We will tell you, it's a little commercial, but we'll tell you who your new donors are that you should call and kind of prompt you to do those things because we have the data that shows it's really effective. Now, afterwards, you know, as you're getting into some of those other pieces that you want to send, you know, a nice letter a unique letter that only first time donors get. It's only for first time donors. Maybe it's a part of a welcome kit. This is an awesome welcome kit that I got from uh, an organization here in Indy where, you know, nice packet, thanks for your first gift. That's, that's all you have to do for segmentation. Tell them you know it's their first gift. Dear Abby, thanks for joining our family. Dear Steven, thanks for your first gift. You know, we can't wait to tell you about all the great impact you're having and invite them in for a tour, include a survey. You know, this is a pre-COVID example. This would probably be a virtual tour these days, but a virtual tour, you know, I'm guessing you would get a little bit more people than, than someone, you know, coming out and driving to you uh, because it would take a little bit longer and it's a little bit, um, you know, they have to break a sweat to do that. Um, another welcome kit I got from Girls Inc. I started a monthly donation with them very recently. Um, I, I had a daughter uh, last year. So um, that's not a really good excuse to start giving to Girls Inc., but I did it anyway. And, you know, nice letter. Thanks for becoming, you know, you're now part of our family. So again, it's something that is specific to only first time donors. Um, a one to one email, you know, don't be afraid to fire up Gmail or Outlook and email one person. No, I'm not talking about mass emails. I'm talking about writing one email to one person the same way you would write an email to a coworker or a family member. This is one where I had started a monthly contribution and uh, got a nice email from the director of development just saying, hey, thanks for being a monthly donor, for becoming one. Send me a nice thank you video. So I would definitely um, consider this to be a personal thank you, going back to that research. Made an impact, right? Way better than some automatic receipt or a mass email from like Bloomerang or MailChimp. This is also something that we have seen amongst our customers be really successful is emailing one person to one person. It's kind of a lost art, um, but again, it will. I think it will rise in, in the inbox. It will, it will avoid the spam filter because it's a plain text email. And I think it will also make an impression and kind of stand out uh, for those reasons. The other thing I wanna uh, kind of suggest to you is pay attention with, within your cohort of first time donors, you can further segment that group by the channel of giving. Do they give offline? Do they give through the mail? Maybe a virtual event? Do they give through your website? Do they give through peer-to-peer? -peer? There are differences in retention rates depending on the gift channel. Now, online donors tend to have a little bit lower, and I think it's because they very often get kind of robotic, you know, transactional receipts that are kind of scary or boring or both. Um, you know, Donate to yourself. You know, we're coming up to year end. We're getting close to Giving Tuesday. Look real closely at what these donors are getting for you from your website, from your online giving provider, those automatic receipts, the thank you page of your website. Even though every donor is going to see these things, if it's a brand new donor, these are the first things they're ever going to get from you after becoming a donor. And you don't want these really boring, scary things you know, you might want something kind of nice like a personal email or maybe a thank you page with a video 
something that tells a story, you know, go into your online giving software, maybe it's your donor database, you know, maybe it's, you know, what you use just for online giving, customize these things. So often these, you know, templates go uncustomized, put some pictures in them, tell a story, you know, really thank that donor. I think the goal here is even though it's an automatic email receipt, could you print it out and mail it, right? Would it be a pretty good thank you letter if you mailed it? Now you would probably want to take off the social media buttons. You know, that wouldn't make much sense. But I think it's a pretty good goal is, does it look as good as your kind of thank you letters? And then for new donors, I mentioned this before, but get to know them, right? They're new. They're practically a stranger to you. You want to know why they gave, how they heard about you, um, what the connection is to your cause. These are very hard things to assume or extract without directly asking. Not only is that information really valuable, but we have research that shows that donors want to talk about those things. They like being asked. And I know that we get bombarded with surveys from businesses all the time, right? I mean, I, I can't go to the grocery store without getting um, a survey from Kroger. That's the grocery store up here. You guys have, you guys have Publix down there, which is really awesome. I get jealous of you Floridians if you're in Florida listening, but get to know your donors, right? If you got a birthday present from a stranger, that would be kind of weird. And you might want to know how they found out that it was your birthday and how do they know that you like Legos? Like have that same kind of mentality to your brand new donors. Hey, Abby, thanks so much for donating. You know, notice it was your first donation. That's awesome. How'd you hear about us? Why do you care about the Everglades, right? Why do you care about um, the, the literacy rate here in Lakeland, Florida, ask. You're not gonna get 100% response rate. That's not the point, don't get discouraged. Bloomerang customers who send surveys, it's like a 10% response rate. That's okay. The 10% answers that you get are gonna be worth their weight in gold for communicating back to those people. You may get two donations today from two people, both $20, they both gave online, they both live in your city, and it's tempting to maybe treat those people in the same way. But one of those people may have a completely different reason for giving than the other. And if you ascertain that reason, you can communicate to them better rather than kind of lumping them into the same communication cadence, right? For example, someone who gives to you, you're an Alzheimer's organization, right? Just pull that out. So maybe they had a grandparent who died in Alzheimer's versus someone who saw a TV commercial and was just kind of moved in the moment or a Facebook ad. Those are very, very different types of donors. And if you find that out, or if you know the channel, if you know, you know the marketing attribution and the reason for giving, you can communicate better to those people. And not wildly different, right? You're not totally reinventing the wheel, but it will give you a little bit of an edge uh, in commuting to, communicating to those people. So surveys, you can do a lot of different ways. Maybe your software has it. You can get SurveyMonkey separately, Google Forms. You can do them electronically. You can do them on paper. You can send them out in the mail. Um, paper surveys are great, no problem. Um, but do it and do it for lots of different types of donors. Maybe you have a new donor survey. Maybe you have a lapsed donor survey. Don't call them a lapsed donor in the survey, by the way. You have a monthly donor survey. Um, you know, and you can ask these people different questions based on that type of giving. How are you thanked? Are we, are we as an organization doing okay? Not just getting to know the donor, which is important, but also, you know, how are we doing um, in communicating to you? Maybe after they've been giving a little while would be a good question to ask there. And then you can kind of compare your, your efforts and see, gee, you know, this group of donors, they seem um, committed to us. They seem to like our cause, but maybe the satisfaction rating is low. You know, maybe we could thank them better or faster and you can kind of tweak your efforts. That's another kind of value to, to doing these surveys. And I, I mentioned this, but again, within your, your bucket of first time donors, you can further segment, right? You can look at gift amount, gift channel. There are a couple channels specifically where you absolutely want to thank them differently than the rest of your new donors. And I'm on a QGIV webinar, so I feel kind of silly, but peer to peer donors, that's what we could talk for hours about communicating specifically to brand new peer to peer donors. That really takes some specialization because you've got that third party, right, who raised money for you. You might want to include that person, at least mention them, 
weave them in, maybe have them, you know, kind of explain why they chose your nonprofit to raise money for. That's a true art form. And if you don't do these things, it can be harder to retain those donors. If you just kind of treat them like a normal, regular donor who came right to you, that's where we see the retention rates suffer. But QGIVE, I mean, they wrote the book on this literally. If you follow them, I know they've got a ton of great advice um, for, for doing this specifically. But again, it's something to pay attention to because even within your bucket of first-time donors, they are going to be really, really different people. And that, that's the value of segmentation, right? I mean, you can segment deeper and deeper until you get down to one person. Uh, maybe that's still going a little overboard. Um, but you know, the more you do it, I think the, the bigger the ROI there for sure. But again, pick up the phone. If, if there's something I can impress upon you, it's just the power uh, of that phone call. You know, we looked at that research, especially for first time donors. If you get a phone number, if you don't, I, I don't recommend going and trying to find one, but you can ask for one, you know, maybe that can be part of the initial follow up. Um, hey, we want to, you know, complete your contact information or, or tell them, hey, we'd like to give you a call and, and, and say thanks. Or, you know, if you'd ever like to, you know, talk to someone here, we can set up a call and answer questions. That's OK. Um, if you don't get that phone number, a one to one email, you know, a nice handwritten note, you probably have their address because of the credit card um, or if they mailed you a check, you got their return address. Um, but the phone is great. It'll stand out. Voicemails are fine. Voicemails are just as good. But if they do pick up the phone, you know, you're going to have a little bit of chit chat and, and maybe get to know them. And this is something that scales really well, right? You can maybe run a report of all your brand new donors this week or this month, farm it out to your board members, give them five donors each to call just to say thank you. You saw the power of board members doing that from that research I showed you. And um, pretty soon you can be, you know, call 100 donors. Um, spread amongst you know 10 or 15 people, that goes pretty quick and we'll have a, a really big outcome there. So new donors are great. Um, if you're thinking, gee, we get a lot of new donors, Stephen, we can't call all of them. That's good. I, I understand that concern. By the way, if you've got a lot of new donors, that's awesome. Congratulations. At that point, you might want to look at things like gift amount. Maybe you call everyone who gives above your average gift amount, right? Because you can't get to everybody you get a $5 donor and a $500 donor, you can only call one. I think common sense dictates which one you're gonna call. My only caveat to you is that most new donors do not give at capacity, which kind of makes sense, right? They're brand new, they're never given to you. They're not gonna drop a million dollars in your lap right away, kind of warm up to that. So if you do segment by gift amount, just be careful. Don't judge people too much by their by their dollar amount. You know, this is where things like well screening can really come in handy. Maybe you can kind of get a sense of their capacity, or do they give elsewhere? And that can guide your efforts, I think, a little bit better than just their gift amounts there. So, um, just to wrap up, it's almost three o'clock uh, Eastern here. Uh, I want to do some questions if, if 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 you all have some, but hey, make it a priority. You know, culturally, I, I think if you have an internal culture where you all celebrate a new donation, maybe you have some kind of mechanism where if you get a brand new donor, everyone's alerted and you can kind of celebrate that. You know, maybe you have a gong in your office that you ring or a bell or something when you are in the office, I should say, celebrate that. You convinced a brand new stranger to give to you. That is worth celebrating. I think that is something that you should maybe, that should kind of pervade your entire organization. Get to know these people, make sure that you are thanking them, kind of previewing what comes next, but you know, ask them those questions, you know, find out what it is that makes them tick. It'll help you communicate to them um, going forward. Call them if you get a phone number and it was not required, that's almost an, an invitation to do so. They may actually be expecting that, or at least kind of wonder, well, why did they ask me, you know, if they're not gonna, if they're not gonna call me. Um, practice, you know, make a loose script. You're going to go off script, of course, if they do pick up the phone. You don't want it to sound too robotic. But after you call a couple donors, I think you'll say to yourself, gee, this is easy. This isn't so bad. This is actually kind of fun. Um, and you'll get into a good groove there. Um, don't be afraid to ask for that second gift quickly, as long as you did a good job stewarding them, getting to know them, making them feel really 
uh, appreciated for that giving. And this scales really well to board members, right? Not only do you probably have eight or 10 or 12 people who can help out, who may shy away from fundraising, well, maybe they won't shy away from, from stewardship. Um, give them a call list. Hey, these are the new donors this week. Give them each a call list, have them do it. Research shows that it makes a big difference if a board member does it. I think it's because they're a volunteer, they're not paid. Maybe they're like a big shot in your community. Maybe they have some name recognition um, and, and they can speak again to why they support you um, in the same way that the donor does. So get them involved. Um, and if you need some tips on that, we've got lots of blog posts on our website. That's, that's about it for me. Um, if you were wondering what the heck is Bloomerang, we're, we're donor database. You can check us out. You can watch videos. You can kind of see what we're all about. We're pretty easy to find. We integrate with QGIVE. We love QGIVE. I mean, what can I say? They're awesome. You should check them out also. We got a lot of free uh, resources on our website. Um, lots more examples beyond what I showed here. We got lots of eBooks. I got an eBook on first time donor retention specifically that I think is actually better than the slides. We'll send you the slides, but I'll, I'll give that eBook to folks too um, so that uh, you can, you can kind of keep reading. Uh, we just also, also got a lot of um, coronavirus uh, fundraising case studies. We've been collecting stories from uh, nonprofits that, that have been successful. Check those out. I think those will do you some good going into year end. And um, Abby, if anyone is still uh, awake, I'd love to take questions if, uh, if there are any. So I'm, uh, I'm at your service. <laughs> I think you underestimate how interesting this is if you <laughs> are saying that you wonder if people are still awake. Um, I do have some questions for you. One of them is pretty straightforward. So kind of at the beginning of the presentation, you referenced ROI and the money that you put into acquiring new donors as opposed to the money that you can earn from those new donors. Yeah. And Chitra asked for a little bit of clarification. So in one slide, you referenced a $29 cost of donor acquisition. And she wanted to know if that was um, like an actual average that you saw is that a benchmark that we should be using and if it is kind of where did it come from and or is it just kind of an arbitrary example that was a purely an example that was not based on data that was nothing uh <laughs> that was just for illustrative purposes i i should uh i should have uh explained that early on so i apologize for that but yeah i think it, it'll take you to kind of you know calculate what that is and that's a really really hard metric to calculate you know, that's not something that you can easily pull. You know, you have to weigh in staff time, all the overhead costs, the cost of whatever campaign you did. You know, if, if you get a new donor at an event, that's a little easier to calculate because you got the cost of the event um, uh, to, and then, you know, divided by maybe all, all of the attendees who came or all the people who were exposed to it. Um, that is a tough metric. So that's one where, um you know you may have to you do a little bit el elbow grease there and it's never going to be perfect because it's hard it's it's a lot of times hard to dial in okay what were the very specific things that generated that donation a lot of and everyone struggles with this businesses struggle with this nonprofits struggle with this it's a tough metric to get but if you can get close to some sort of maybe average of hey this this month this is how much it costs to keep the nonprofit running. And this is how many don you know, new donors or, or dollars we brought in. You know, simply dividing those things, I think, can get you to a, a pretty close number, at least to give you an idea of, of where you stand on that. But the point there is, is you know, very often you're spending more than, than what that donor is giving on the first gift. And every subsequent gift, is kind of free money on top of that. And you can kind of dig yourself out of that ROI hole over time. Totally. I'm glad that you called out that that's a difficult yes. <laughs> metric to calculate. Um, it's something that I see a lot of conversations about among some of the people we work with and that it is hard for everybody. So I'm really glad you, you called <laughs> that out. Um, someone asked, Tammy, this asked this great question about monthly donors. What do you recommend to thank monthly donors. I know we want to thank them um, when they set up their initial gift. I know we yep. want to thank them when they kind of get to the end of the year. Yep. How do you recommend it handling 
kind of the interim messages. I know sure. I am a monthly donor and I often get the same form letter over and over again, which right. is kind of a bummer, but it's so much work to keep that updated. What do you suggest? You read my mind exactly. You know, really thank them in the beginning when they start. So this is an example of that where there was a nice personal email, a video, you know, thanks for becoming a monthly donor. And then you said it again, Abby, year end, maybe you send them a nice summary. You know, maybe there's a special monthly donor um, annual report that only monthly donors get. But that interim, you said it. I, I would not send 12 receipts. You don't have to do that. I, I know there's some kind of tax law like threshold where you have to, you know, report back on a specific dollar amount. But if you do that 12 times in the same 12 ways or in mm -hmm. the same one way, I guess you could say, it kind of starts to feel like a utility bill, right? It feels yeah. like that cell phone bill you get, your electric bill. Tell a different, tell some stories, right? Maybe four or five times a year, you send them a video or a voicemail or a handwritten note that just says, hey, Abby, thanks so much for being a monthly donor. Wanted to tell you a quick story about something cool that happened here this month. And, you know, it's all because of, of monthly donors like you, you know, surprise and delight them. I think, you know, my short answer for monthly donors is surprise and delight them. Things only monthly donors get intermittent, you know, four to six times a year, a stewardship piece, a, a voicemail, a phone call, a handwritten note, a video. Um, that's what I would do. I wouldn't send the same 12 things every single, every single time. Cause it just, it, it, you know, if, if people's budgets get tight, they're going to feel like that's something they can cut from their budget, like Netflix or something, you know, small versus, Hey, you know, they've been thanking me. They've been telling stories and, you know, let's, let's keep that going. Let's, let's find some room in that budget since they've been doing such a good job communicating. I think it'll have that mental effect. Yeah. And, yeah. um, Tammy, I was also going to tell you one really minor thing you can do, um, just to kind of keep things updated is if you are sending out just a transaction like summary for people, I know that's required by law in a number of places, um, yeah. something as small as just changing out the picture that you have at the top could, mm. could be really big. Yeah. Um, Stephen, I know it's after three and but people are sticking around. Do you have time for another couple of questions? Yeah, let's do it. Awesome. Uh, so this one is really interesting. Laura asks if you have any specific advice for those nonprofits that are in more challenging sectors uh, like domestic violence or disabilities mm -hmm. or poverty reduction over things that are uh, easier to kind of make cute like puppies pet <laughs> and what um, do you engage with people differently? Do you tr like do you have any ideas about how to get people engaged? Uh, in a way that is productive and doesn't make people like sad or feel overwhelmed with these huge problems? Yeah, let me, well, I'll tell you a personal story. I'm, I'm a monthly donor to a, a refugee resettlement org here in Indy. Uh, they're called Exodus Refugee, awesome or organization, we're a monthly donor. And they, so my, my answer there is don't shy away from the storytelling. Now you have that extra challenge of, you don't want to be exploitative. Sometimes there aren't very positive outcomes to share a lot of times, but when there are, the challenge there is to do it in a way that that is very respectful. So what Exodus does is I'll get stories from them every once in a while. One, one came to mind as you were reading the question is they sent me a photograph of artwork that some of the refugee kids had done while they were kind of waiting to be placed, you know, um, at the facility. And it was cool. They had, it was, it was, um, it showed off kind of their country of origin. And then mm -hmm. the let the accompanying letter said something like, you know, hey, Stephen, thanks for being a monthly donor. Wanted to share some, a picture of some artwork that some, some recent kids did who, you know, came through our, our program. And, you know, the, and it was kind of a joyful, you know, it was very, it was kind of a positive, bright looking piece of art. Um, and it says, you know, you're already helping them kind of, you know, get on the path towards a more positive, uh, you know, life here, uh, settling in the States. And, and I, I'm a bad copywriter, so I apologize if I'm not uh, communicating this very well, but it was like that. So it wasn't, it wasn't a, it wasn't a kid's face, right? It wasn't, yeah. it, it, it doesn't always have to be faces in the picture, I guess is what I'm saying there. 
is there something you can show? Can you show um, a photograph of, of a house or an apartment that uh, a domestic violence survivor recently moved into, right? That's kind of a positive image there where you don't have to show a face. So it does take a little bit of creativity. Is, is there some kind of secondary layer that you can visualize that still has and might even have a bigger impact. I think it would have a bigger impact than simply, you know, a smiling face that just, hey, this is a person who whose life we improved. And, you know, a lot of people don't want to be on camera. So you've got that extra challenge. So is there some, can you drill like a layer deeper uh, for the storytelling and show something else? And I think if you do that, you'll also be showing a more tangible impact than just, you know, a, a smiling face in a lot of cases. It's hard. Um, but if, if that person emails me, I forget, I forget the name. I know you said it before, but if you want to email me, I'll send you that piece, uh, from that organization and, uh, and maybe their Facebook page, they do a really good job of it's Exodus refugee in Indianapolis. If you go to their Facebook page, you'll see a lot of examples of the kinds of things I'm talking about here. They're awesome. You, you also just gave me an idea. Um, when you said it doesn't have to be a face, it made me yeah. think of that, um, that group humans of New York and yeah. how he photographs a lot of people who don't want to be on camera but he'll right. photograph like their shoes or their hands, their hands. Or yeah like that. that's a good idea absolutely yep so i have this question um and it i know it's a controversial one in the nonprofit world i love it <laughs> do you suggest doing an incentive like a gift card or something in appreciation for first-time donors or no uh i do here's what i would do i would do a sticker. I love Ooh. stickers. I'm obsessed with stickers. I wrote like a 10,000 word blog post about stickers. If you Google Bloomerang blog stickers, you will read it. It's my magnum opus. It's, it's the best thing I've ever written, I think. I'm a big fan of stickers. Here's my idea. Uh, here's, here's the case for stickers. They're incredibly cheap. It's like three cents uh, a piece if you buy them in bulk. Um, they fit in an envelope. They won't increase the size of the envelope, the, um, the, the postage, anything like that. And you give the donor a way to show off their pride in your organization or the cause. And it's a little bit better if it's, if it's a little bit more beyond just your organization and more about the cause. I mean, think about driving around how many bumper stickers you see, window stickers, people's laptops, people's uh, mugs and water bottles. People like to show off what they believe in. And if you empower them to do it, not only can you create a little bit of stickiness between you and, and, and the donor, but you're also kind of creating a little bit of a moving billboard for you. And I'm not saying that somebody's gonna see you know, your bumper sticker and donate, but they might see your bumper sticker or a little window decal and be a little curious and maybe look you up and who knows what that could lead to. I'm a big fan of stickers. I'm not a huge fan of like calendars and mugs because of all the things I talked about. They, they jack up the postage. They're more expensive to produce, you know, t-shirts I'm kind of marginal on, you know, no one's really going out in public these days, um, which is kind of an argument about stickers, but stickers are really cheap. And you can slip it in there. And um, I think I had an example of that. I think that I think Girls Inc. sent me a sticker for being a new donor. Um, yeah, I think they did. Yeah. They also sent me that little flower pot thing, which I thought that was creative. Where you know they're talking about, hey, we help we help you know girls kind of blossom into you know adults. So it was kind of on message there. Um, and again, that's something that fit in the envelope and you know kind of gave them something to do. So I'm a big fan of those things. But um, yeah, stickers for monthly donors, maybe not first time donors, it might be a little too early on, but if somebody starts a monthly commitment, I would have some stickers for monthly donors because they they like you, right? They're, they're pretty invested. Um, but to answer the question, yeah, I'm not a big fan of kind of the, the, bigger, um, the bigger things or incentives or things like that. But if you can give them something that makes them or allows them to show off their pride, that's when I think really cool things happen. Love that. Yeah, as a donor, if you sent me a mug or a gift card, I would kind of feel like I just bought myself a gift card. Right. But um, as someone who has been a recipient of a sticker from Stephen Shattuck, I can attest to the fact that stickers <laughs> are really great. I practice what I preach there. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, do you have a like a recommended place to order them? Yeah, Sticker Mule. If if you um if you go to my blog post, there's a coupon code that they gave mm -hmm. me for people. Um, it's at the bottom of the blog post, so you awesome. get you get a discount or something. Yeah. Okay, everyone, I sent that link to you in the chat, and I'll also include it in the follow up email. Um, and I have one more question from Betsy. So she asks a great question. How do you uh, strategize doing a second ask for new donors around that 90 day mark if you're also trying to kind of integrate them into the the annual solicitation schedule that people have already kind of established? Yeah. Um, how do you do that? They, they may overlap, right? And they're probably going to overlap from now until the end of the year, right? If you get a new donor on October, you know, that 90 day mark is going to be right at year end. Um, I think that it's segmentation, right? You're still sending that that year end campaign, but brand new donors, they get a different version of that letter than maybe another group. Maybe it's the rest of your donors. Maybe there are several different groups that have different letters. Um, I would look at those new donors. I would look at gift amount and say, okay, who gave a small amount? that maybe we could convert into monthly donors, right? Maybe that's the ask. Hey, Abby, thanks so much for your first gift a few months back. You know, you've made a big impact. We're so happy to have you as part of the family. It's year end. We wanted to tell you about our monthly giving program. It just so happens to start at that near that small dollar amount that they gave. Maybe versus someone who gave you a hundred dollars um, as their first gift. Maybe you would ask them for, you know, another hundred dollars, another, you know, a small upgrade, 120, you know, some kind of giving ladder. You know, it, it doesn't matter as much as long as you get the second gift. It's okay if they downgrade slightly on the second gift. The fact that they gave a second time is the goal. It doesn't actually matter necessarily how much they gave. But Betsy, I, I think just segmentation, right? Hopefully you're not just sending, you know, one one year end appeal to everybody but have a couple different versions, you know, look at people, you know, for your existing monthly donors, they should get something. Maybe, maybe for them, you're asking them to upgrade for 2021, right? Abby, hey, you've been a monthly donor. We so appreciate that. You know, would you be willing to go from $10 to $12 a month in the coming year? You know, we can have so much of a bigger impact there. So it's okay if those things coincide, but the, the 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 key is is segmenting them so not everyone is getting the one same uh, version of that appeal because it's not going to be it's only going to speak to a small percentage of people. That is a great answer. Um, <laughs> I you've given us so much to think about and so much to act upon, and I really appreciate you sharing all those sure. ideas and sticking around late and answering questions. Oh, I awesome. love it. I'll talk about um, this stuff all day. <laughs> <laughs> I will make you do that, uh, <laughs> even though I could probably do that as well. Um, everyone, if you have had any questions that we weren't able to get to, please tweet at me. It's just at QGive. Um, either we'll answer your question or I'll reach out and send you an email or we'll figure something out. I want to make sure your questions all have answers, especially as we go into the year and fundraising season. Steven, you are a star. I love working with you every time. It's great. Yeah. I hope you have a great day. Everyone, keep your eye on your inbox. Uh, I'll get you the email with the slides and the recording and some other resources tomorrow. And in the meantime, I hope you all have a great week and I will talk to you soon.